Hello and welcome. I'm Sam Robinson, psychotherapist in Austin, Texas. I'm here today with Lisa Schwartz as a part of a series of interviews with expert practitioners of different forms of experiential psychotherapy. In this series, we interview a wide variety of experiential practitioners so as to compare and contrast the thinking and techniques of different experiential methodologies. Lisa is a licensed psychologist in private practice in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and is a developer of the Comprehensive Resource Model, a trauma therapy system of healing that employs robust layers of brain and body-based safety as the foundation for healing. She's the primary author of the Comprehensive Resource Model, Effective Therapeutic Techniques for Healing Complex Trauma, and has presented at numerous international professional conferences since 2009. For the last 38 years, she's been dedicated to creating innovative methods for working with severe dissociative disorders, attachment disorders, gestational and ancestral trauma. Her work bridges neuroscience and multidimensional consciousness in trauma healing through a combination of traditional psychotherapy, indigenous healing methods, and an attachment-based conceptualization. So excited to have you here. Thank you. Let's uh, let's jump right in. So tell us about CRM and yeah, in what ways it's experiential. Well, um, it, I would I guess I would start with a, a piece of the conceptualization that we work from, which is if one were to look at kind of the fractal of reality, the fractal of life, the fractal of human evolution or de-evolution, one of the primary, at least in my opinion, one of the primary underlying issues is in terms of trauma and the causes of trauma and the effects of trauma is separation. So separation from the body, say, separation from the, the intuition, separation from our ancestors, separation from just our, our memories, you know, through dissociation, separation from our physical body, separation from the planet, separation from the inextricable truth that we are inextricably connected to every living thing on the planet. It just, just a separation from higher principles. Um, and basically, probably most, most importantly, separation from who we really are, you know, like our core true self that is the, the essential self that is not affected by trauma, but is simply covered up by it and buried by it and dissociated because of it, um, et cetera, et cetera. So in CRM, given that that is a, the primary conceptualization in terms of what needs healed, what is the mission? In CRM, the mission is to bring people back to wholeness and to association and connection to all those things I just listed. So in 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 order to stay alignment in alignment with that mission, one must be connected to the therapy every single second and every single moment of the therapy work um, in order for it to be, you know, kind of walking the talk of that conceptualization. So when we're working in with CRM, um, the entire process is one, and this is because of the way it's designed, is one in which a person is supported in connecting to their experience moment to moment, whether it is a body sensation, whether it is a thought, whether it is a memory, whether it is a um, an emotion, whether it is, well, I guess that would be about it, um, <laughs> that we would be experiencing. But um, we the, the purpose of CRM is to allow those kind of experiences to occur, the, the experience in the therapy, whether it's, like I said, the thoughts, the emotions, the memories, the, the the body sensations is is to promote the experience of those things moment to moment by providing brain and body based safety. So brain and body based safety meaning the neural circuits in the brain, the neurochemical releases in you know across the brain are all activated and switched on in a way that allows a person to experience 
truth to experience what is, whether it's trauma or something positive, a resource, a treasure, a, a gift, a, 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 a medicine inside themselves, to be able to experience all of that fully in an authentic way without the defense responses that our autonomic nervous system you know, facilitates of fight, flight, freeze, hide, avoid, submit, collapse, or dissociate, which are our normal experiences. And we don't want to recreate a dissociative experience in the therapy, even though it might look like it's therapeutic in some ways. It actually is just promoting separation from the core, buried, camouflaged, hidden material that is at the root of what is driving everything. So everything about it is experiential in nature. Mm -hmm. And that's why, because of the issue of separation and reconnection that we work with on all the different dimensions, timelines, et cetera. Well, it sounds like such a vast um, mm -hmm. methodology. I mean, even what you were saying in, before about the physical planet, causes, effects, trauma, like um, heritage and all of that stuff. It's like, wow, how do you even know what thing it's experienced in the therapy is connected to like trauma or like this previous life situation or something. Mm -hmm. But I also hear you saying it's a, it seems to be a lot about integration of like whatever that is making the symptom happen or whatever, like we're going to get there in the therapy, right? Right, exactly. So it is, well, it's kind of, you know, trauma is complicated. Um, and not just complicated because someone was sexually abused and or someone was neglected or someone, I mean, any, the myriad types, of, I mean, millions of kinds of trauma. When I say trauma is complex, I don't mean each event is very, very complicated. It might be, I mean, actually everything is complicated, but the, the reach, the, the, you know, there's so many fingers that, that are a result of it, a cause of trauma. Um, and, and all the way down to the quantum particles, like actually in our physical body in a way that can create disease, um, and then all the way out to the cosmic, that the, the solution to the healing needs to be a sophisticated solution to deal with the complexity of the problem. Um, and that's what I had kind of thought was happening before I developed the model. It felt like things were being simplified and a lot was being missed. Um, and so, yes, it's vast. It's difficult to teach unless a person is truly dedicated because it isn't a protocol driven therapy. And it does encompass across timelines, lineages, dimensions, species, you know, all the, I mean, ev everything, what I mentioned. And so, yeah, it it's a lot. The beauty of it is if one is dedicated to learning it or dedicated to staying in the treatment, um, you know, the healing work with it, it's really thorough. And so when when the work is um, completed or resolved, the consolidation of the change sticks. It sticks over time for the most part, you know, unless there's like another angle of betrayal we haven't addressed yet. But that doesn't mean that the work that we've done didn't stick. It just means, well, there's the complications of all this. There's more layers to it. So that's what I would say about it. Yes, there is a lot to it. And it is a criticism, actually. You know, people come and take the training and just say it's too much. It's too complicated. Well, yeah, it is. And so everybody has a choice as to what kind of work they want to provide for other human beings. You know, every there's no judgment, at least in me, in terms of what one chooses to to do as a as a therapist. But this is what I've chosen, and what I, you know, really truly believe is is uh, one of the most thorough ways of working out there because it is working across dimensions, not just, you know, in in the brain. Since you know, I was two. <laughs> Or a person was a child it's much more than that mm -hmm. yeah yeah what i really love too is how you're you're sort of you know that people refer to like complex trauma but you're saying no trauma is complex <laughs> like you know it's, it's it's far reaching in terms of its impacts on a cellular level it's not just some trauma is more complex than others it's like no it's it's really complex therefore the yeah. methodology i've created is 
vast and complex because you're looking at not just like you said how it shows up in the body but in everything in life out in the cosmos whatever and i'd love to know more about that i, I guess it maybe be i wonder if you have like um an example of what a session might look like with a new client is that or, or even you know it doesn't have to be a real client either or one that's yeah. made up that could really be like okay the client comes in and they say i have this problem going on like how does crm guide the therapist in thinking about the client in what to go where to go next and to, you know and all of that stuff yeah that's a really good question and um a vast answer because it's it depends on it depends on honestly what the client chooses their outcome to be because if someone comes and says i have migraines then the work is going to be done around finding the root origin, the source of the migraines, period. And they may not want to go any further once the migraines are eliminated, say. And I mean, you could put any symptom in there, depression, panic attacks, whatever you want to say. Um, and so that's that. That's the client's choice. They just want their migraines to go away. But in the process of healing the migraines... There's numerous other sources of material that indicate or reveal other areas for healing, for evolution, for association. Um, and if the client does not want to go in that direction, then that is going to inform how we work. Because if I get a client who's like, just lay it on me, like I want to just do whatever you're able to do, then what I do and how I decide to work is going to look much different from someone who's coming for just symptom alleviation, which CRM can do. It can do symptom alleviation. Um, but if let me think of a of a case that might might be a good example. Um, I'm trying to think of who I've been working with. So. Okay, let's take migraines as a matter of fact for for uh, uh, a presenting problem. And normally, people who have chronic migraines have a lot of depression. Um, the the issue itself creates you know panic, hopelessness. It can create a lot of anxiety. Can create a lot of you know life interference day to day. Um, so there's other mental health issues that go along with migraines. But just say somebody presents with that. So in our perspective and CRM's perspective we're looking to connect to the internal conflict, the internal paradox that in my experience is the foundation of migraines. So pretty much 90% of the people I've worked with who have severe headaches and migraines, it's rooted in a type of you know internal conflict or paradox, which is the um, experience, talking about experiential, it is the experience that is nonstop. It's a constant experience of holding the tension of opposites for which there seems to be no solution. And just even that in itself can create, you know, again, panic attacks, anxiety, depression, the need to control through addictions, eating disorders. So all of these things are always combined and, and connected anyways in people. But so someone would come in and the first thing I would do is take a history in a way which allows me to understand what kind of childhood trauma and gestational trauma they have in this timeline, which will then inform how dissociative I know they're going to be, regardless of what they say or what the intake worker diagnosed them as. And the level of dissociation is important because that informs what kind of, of, of setup I do with them in order to make sure people are in their physical body during the therapy. Because it is my opinion that if a human being is not embodied, meaning not dissociated outside of their body, that they are in the moment, consciously aware, moment to moment in their human physical body, that that is what is needed, number one, in order for the work to have any kind of consolidation that does stick, and also for the client to experience the actual origin of the problem in a way that allows the mechanism of change to work, which is, we can talk about that later, but um, the, the point being, I'm trying not to 
it is difficult sometimes to simplify all this, but it, it is about teaching someone different types of breathwork skills, different types of sacred geometry skills, different types of sound code work, sound healing work, attachment resourcing, um, accessing different parts of our, our hindbrain and, and our actually our DNA in terms of our ancient connection to nature. Um, all of those and, and especially the attachment processes. Um, when you have a brain that has these numerous types of resourcing in place at one time, that allows a person to be fully embodied. That allows a person to be fully present, experiencing the remembering, experiencing more resourcing, experiencing the the activation that comes you know, in, 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 when you're engaged with the therapist and they're asking questions or having you do certain types of attentional focus, focus, focus breathing or um, some of the other things that we use. Um, so the first thing would be to delineate the level of dissociation, which will then inform how much resourcing they're going to need, what types of obstacles and blocks to being in the body are going to be there. I mean, when you've done this a long time, you know, like all of us just know, you have this kind of history, this kind of thing going on, there's going to be a lot of blocks and obstacles to actually being able to be in the body. And so then we would be addressing that. And that will come, of course, from negative belief systems about the self, hidden unconscious belief systems, memories, fears, things like that. And those need to be addressed as well. And then once, once you get a person to where they're able to stay in the body, in the moment, moment to moment in the work for, you know, a significant amount of time, or at least if they start to drift away, they can easily be, be brought back. Um, and that you work through the blocks and obstacles to being in the body, which yes, will be other trauma, but that's what the model's able to do. Um, then you would start to work with the, um, the, the trauma symptoms themselves. I can say like in terms of where would I pick to work gestationally, which would be in utero generationally, do I start with this timeline? You know, there, there's in, in our, in our conceptualization, there's four different fingers of origin of work that all needs to be addressed. Um, and that would be the current timeline from conception all the way to current day. The second finger, so to speak, would be the maternal paternal and spiritual lineages, that trauma. And then the four, the third is our, if for people who have the belief system, our soul journey or our past lives. And then the fourth, the fourth is the more esoteric, metaphysical, darker realms of um, energy and uh, cosmic and galactic history and other more undigestible things for the mainstream at least, but they're, they're really, really influential in, the tr in terms of what's really happening in those realms. So it's, when you, when you ask, where would you know, how do you know where to start? It's like, usually we would start in this timeline, just because in order to do the work in those other air, those other three fingers, so to speak, excuse me, you need to be really um, comfortable with the CRM process, a client does, and the therapist, but the client needs to really get it. They need to be comfortable. They need to be comfortable with the therapist, with the process. They need to understand how it all fits together, and they do need to be fully in their body because the, the more a person is in their body moment to moment as they're working, paradoxically, the higher the dimensional consciousness one has access to. So you can't go deep into the array of, of dimensional consciousness in yourself um, or in the fractal of reality if you aren't actually fully in the human body. So it's a paradox, but it's true. So so it it doesn't it it makes sense to just start with this timeline. That's what people are more familiar with. That's what they think therapy is. Um, if I just started to work immediately on like, oh, let's go with your past lives, you know, where a lot of material, the roots do sit back in those soul journeys. You, you know, people would be alienated and not not come back. So I'm trying to bridge the gap between traditional, straight, mainstream, therapeutic expectations and process with what I know is the truth of what else is really going on underneath the surface. So that's where we would start. We would start with mapping out somebody's internal landscape. And again, teaching these different ways of staying in the body and activating different neurochemicals according to secure attachment um, and uh, 
allowing parts of the midbrain to really create the framework for being able to orient toward and step into the most intolerable pain, emotional or physical, that, you know, you're, normally your brain is the superior colliculi and the brain is saying, don't orient over there. No, 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 no. Let's look, stay over here because that's a threat. Well, we're disarming that system. So the, the superior colliculi can say, oh, it's safe enough. We can look at all this. But the only way to do that is to create that level of resourcing that is in different brain structures and dimensions and different areas of the work. Yeah, I think it's, um, I just want to say, I love the the preemptive, like, um, training of like, okay, is it, can this person um, maintain connection to their self and body during this work? Because we're going to deepen, we're going to go straight into what is most scary and uncomfortable and terrifying. And if you disassociate, the work is not going to be effective. Eff effective. Yeah. So I love the time. I was just thinking, wow, that's a whole chunk of therapy in itself just to have someone to maintain. Because like you said, as a population, how how unintegrated we are as people, it's like not everyone's coming in with a centered like, OK, let's go like to the depths of the of what I know is, you know, all of that. It's really it must take some time sometimes to just build the safety with the client and for them to trust themselves that they can do this type of work and go to these places. And um, I was going to ask you a question about it. So once you've, um, yeah, once that's all happened, you've someone is sort of, they can stay connected to themselves and the therapy and their body and all of that stuff. And you decide, okay, let's, let's um, start with like conception. Do you just ask the client to tell you what they know? Or are you like, no. Okay. No. So people, especially with conception, I mean, the, the idea and this, this most, you know, a lot of clinicians would say, well, you know, you can't be asking a client what they remember from conception because there was no brain at the moment of conception. So anything they tell you is just going to be some kind of projection or some kind of interjection or some kind of imagination, or I don't know, the family story or whatever, you know, whatever we don't, we don't believe in that um, because, and this is from my experience of doing this work for years with hundreds of people and many other clinicians that do it. This, in order to get to the moment of conception, actually it's the transition between where one was, their soul or their spirit or their energy was right before conception and then moving into conception because that moment is actually a separation problem when you're leaving where you were and coming into a human form so for instance um the, the well to to support what i had said earlier the only way to remember and to access the imprints which are experienced by the, the soul and the very first two cells that they come into you know as a as a, as a being there's an imprint there of what happened Part of our brain as an adult has access to that information. And so when you regress somebody back, and we have specific languaging that we use, it's not hypnosis. It's just literally a remembering back using specific kinds of languaging that allows us to get back to the moment right before conception. So, And because the resourcing is so robust, like I said before, you can access dimensions of information and experience that normally you can't in a conscious way, especially if people are just thinking about, oh, what happened when I was conceived? What were my parents doing? So again, it's the embodiment issue and the ability to access the imprints and the energies and the, the um, just kind of the matrix of information that is imprinted at the moment of conception and then all the way through gestation. So we use a variety of breathing exercises. There are certain types of resource skills in CRM that allow a person to drop into a level of re-membering, you know, re-bringing back all the experience of all of it in a way that they don't need to know one single thing about their conception. In fact, I don't want them to be thinking about that because usually the story that they've heard does not actually match what the body remembers. And even though we didn't have a brain or a body at that time, our experiences start the moment we are conceived. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're one, two cells or eight cells or 100 million, 80 cells, you know, we're still being impacted by the experience moment to moment. 
and the adult brain is so brilliant, it's able to interpret and regurgitate and articulate those experiences now. So you get the truth. Wow, it's so it's so profound to be able to guide someone into that type of access. And mm -hmm. because, yeah, when I asked you the question, I, you know, I was thinking about a client that makes, might say, yeah, my mom and dad were 18 and like they met in college and, <laughs> you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But you're saying it's like a guiding them to connect on a body felt sense level, what the story is around conception yes. for them. Yes, definitely. You know, and even though, and this is another thing people will say, well, m m mom, mom doesn't know she's pregnant until 10 weeks or at least back in my day, it was 10 weeks. We knew, I don't know. It seems like people know sooner. I don't know how that's possible, but you know what I mean? I mean, it's, people will say you can't, there's no, you, the mother didn't know. So how could she have a reaction to, to, to being, being pregnant? That's negative because a lot of times what people remember is they're conceived and they can feel the moment they enter the egg and the sperm, excuse me, a sense of don't want you here, you know, mm -hmm. and there's usually, you know, young parents, parents it, where, where, where pregnancy was an accident or mother and dad are extremely dissociative and traumatized themselves or addicts or deep down inside, you know, mom just wasn't one of those maternal fairy dust mothers who, you know, apparently we're all supposed to be just so excited to be mothers and not all women are. And so, especially, you know, it's a taboo as a woman to say you don't want children or you don't want to be pregnant. We're all supposed to be doing that, supposedly. And so, it, but the truth is, is that a part of mom does know the minute she has conceived, the, the second. And if mom or, or even dad is carrying any kind of just like Oh God, not another one or just anything that just does is not fully welcoming and fully excited and, and looking forward to connecting with a, a new being in their life. The, 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 the energy of the, the baby, the, the embryo feels it. I mean, literally the, the moment of conception. And so that is a separation trauma right there. You're leaving mm -hmm. where you were as a soul coming in separation trauma. Number one, separation trauma. Number two is realizing, Oh, uh, I'm not getting a warm welcome here, even though it's only in two cells. They can, people experience it. And the reason I know this is happening, because I'm sure people will say, that's bullshit. How could you possibly know that? Because when I do this kind of work with people, often they go back and talk to their parents about what was really going on when I was conceived. What were you and dad really thinking? What was really happening then? You know, I've done this work where I got the impression that this is, and even had memories of like, this is what was coming in through your body to me. And it can be a very explicit story. And they'll go, even to nursing homes, they'll go to their parents that old and say, can you tell me what happened and what was going on? And it's literal, literally identical to what they remembered. And this is supposedly, you know, a baby too young to remember. The stories are too specific for it to be a coincidence or for what I'm saying not to have some validity, some validity at least. Yeah, wow, it's so profound. Um, yeah, and I, I wrote that down. I was like, oh, it's separation trauma into separation trauma <laughs> for these um, embryos. And then I was thinking in the work, is it then about um like defining with the client what that means about them or for their life or like you know how do you process it's a great actual, question yeah you know what i mean like what's the healing of it right it's basically mm -hmm. what you're asking what do you do with it the idea is these separation traumas from where you are to coming into embodiment in the cells from you know any anything in mom and dad who were just like it just organically was not welcoming all the way up to you know, they have nine months to, the baby has nine months to start to attune and just get used to whatever the energy is, even if it isn't all that welcoming, even a baby in a drug addict's body attunes and gets used to it. And it's like, yep, this is my mom, yeah, all filled with alcohol and drugs and all this stuff, but it's a, it's a nervous system attunement and the baby will get extremely comfortable with it because that's what they start to resonate and align with. Well, then when they're born, the birth process is another separation trauma because they're now coming out into the world to the real parents who are not able to hold them with a, a complete attunement and love because they are dissociated and now they've been separated from the womb and that safe experience of oh, i got used to it that's familiar and safe so now you have yet another 
separation trauma of just leaving the womb and yet another separation trauma the first time you're held by your parents because they cannot hold you fully 100% with love. So we're one day old and we've already had the separation at conception, the separation from the immediate realization that I'm really kind of, this isn't, I'm not expected, not what, it's not comfortable. Then there's the separation that occurs when you attach to mom through the umbilical cord. That's three, birth process, four, being held for the first time, five. That's five significant separation traumas of in the nervous system, the heart, the soul, the neurochemical systems, and you're one day old. So that's the template that we're starting with in terms of and I'm saying all this to answer your question about, well, how do you heal it? What do you even do with that? Like what, you know, basically they're doomed from like one day old. If you have a certain kind of unhealed, you know, environmental family or parental situation, which complex trauma does. That's why that's the complex trauma. And so um, the goal is to, the goal is to reconsolidate the emotional memory of that type of terror, of that level of abyss, the void, there's nothing here, or that level of disorientation, which is terrifying, enraging, grief, grief inducing, even in an embryo or a baby or any type type of being, even if they're disembodied, by not be not being loved right not being loved and wanted the way instinctually all mammals are designed to be taken care of and loved ferociously, fiercely by their, their mother and their parents. Um, so there's going to be a lot of really, really deep pain as a result of each of those experiences and a million other you know, trauma experiences in families like that. So what we're trying to do is allow the person to remember the experience of that pain that is so unbearable and so intolerable, they've never even come close to it before. And the minute it happened, boom, some kind of dissociation occurred even into a medical condition when there was no brain formed enough for a personality structure to dissociate into. This is where a lot of the, um, the mental health symptoms come from and also medical problems. You can trace them back to in utero separation trauma. And so the idea is to heal this is to the, the dissociation and the symptoms that the, a person has been living with as a result of these things are driven by, maintained, perpetuated, and run by this, this relationship between the threat system, the midbrain, which is where all the affect is generated, um, the autonomic nervous system, which instructs the brain what, what defense response to go into, and the prefrontal cortex, which decide, de determines what we think about what's going on, and the insula and other parts of the brain that are, are creating awareness of what's going on for us to, like, apply all these labels and even more defense systems, you know, that are actually connected to the defense systems. So we have defense responses to defense responses, excuse me, that are you know, originally um, designed to just avoid the most intolerable pain. So in order to decrease or eliminate the defense responses, which are our symptoms, those are the way we engage in relationships, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, dissociation, agoraphobia, um, the, you know, addictions, every single thing that we are working with as therapists can be traced back to intolerable affect that has never been fully experienced. And therefore, the, the brain and body's nervous system and neurochemical systems are just running, 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 running to make sure we don't feel it, that no, it's we're not remembering. And then as people get older, obviously other things get layered on top, other belief systems get reinforced by other experiences, and the whole thing just turns into this gigantic Gordian knot or fractal, so to speak, of trauma, defense responses, intolerable affect, and the the familiarity of what allows a person to not feel the truth of their life, which was, I wasn't loved right. Yeah, yeah. So it's about having the loosening the knot is having the affect be processed, experientially felt fully, fully, fully. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't mean a few tears. And I don't mean like, yeah, I'm feeling really sad. Or even people who are abreacting, so to speak. It's what, you know, when they're like, they're weeping and they're crying or they're screaming or they're raging or whatever they're doing. That does not mean someone has gotten to the root. That just means their nervous system is looping in the affect. We want to get down to what created the need for that looping. And it's going to be an unconsciously buried, deeply unconscious, literally unconscious dissociated experience of the true nature of the split, the true nature of separation from all that we are, you know, divinely created to be connected to, you know, which is attunement, which is unconditional regard, which is safety, which is care, which is being, wa- excuse me, wanted and, and loved and cared for. And it just sounds so trite sometimes to say it like that, but that's really the root of everything, honestly. And the terror and the grief and the rage that comes when no matter what you do, you you come to realize I'm not lovable the way I am. So therefore I'm gonna try all these other different ways to try to get to get loved. And that's what creates all these different kinds of, you know, personality things and the, the personality tests in Cosmopolitan magazine. Are you a people pleaser? Do you do this? Do you do that? Do you do this? And it's like, that's where all that stuff is coming from, really. So in CRM, the mechanism of change is create the brain and body based safety needed for full orientation toward these most intolerable, unconscious, even unknown traumas, the separation aspect of it, it can also have physical pain that goes with it, with the emotional pain, feel all of that fully. And when one can feel what normally has been considered intolerable or unbearable, even on an unconscious level, and suddenly you're able to step in and feel it where it feels like your heart's going to break. It's like so soul searing to remember and feel it, but it only lasts a minute or two. And then boom, it's like, the whole d- defense response system in the autonomic nervous system, the limbic system, all the different parts of, of us as a human being, it just pixelates and dismantles. And there's no more need for those symptoms and those loops because what has been driving them is no longer hidden, secret, buried, and and you know people aren't terrified of the truth of their life whatever that truth may be in many different levels. And that is what creates emotional reconsolidation, meaning the emotions that you felt at these moments of her, you know, really traumatic experiences as a human are no longer driving anything that allows you to avoid integrating and knowing and accepting without judgment, every single thing that happened to you and who you are. And all the things you've done to other people, actually, as an adult, because we all have perpetrator trauma as well. And that's really important as well, to work with the roots of how have we harmed self and other. Everybody wants to avoid that, too, unless they're in jail or there's a major perpetration that's, like, overt. But we've been perpetrating on ourselves and other people in very covert ways and hiding that as well. And um, I did that. I mean, all this I've done myself. I just need to say to your audience... I have done all of this work myself. I have had massive levels of perpetration work I've needed to do in this timeline as well as others. I'm not speaking on anything that I have not looked at in myself. So I'm speaking from a place of my own personal experience and what I know it was really like to do it, as well as just clinically. I just don't want anybody to think like, who was she to talk about all this? You know, it's like, I've been there. (laughs) It was really really hard, (laughs) but you know. Yeah, because I was going to ask you about um, like how you know, like when, like how you even know how to describe that place you can get to, which isn't just a a tear, it's a real heart breaking thing. And you just answered the question of like, well, I've been there, I've been there, my own work. Um, You can feel it, you can feel it in other people when you've done it yourself, it is literally, you just know. So that you can, and this is why, and this is another thing people get really mad at me about, is I'm always telling therapists, you need to do your own work. Like, you, we need to do our own work. I, I say we, but I've been doing mine. Um, we need to. Because if we have not experienced or experienced what it takes to create that kind of conscious awareness, to go that deep, you cannot, just by virtue of the fear that one holds, because they haven't done it, Everybody holds fear of that. Nobody wants to feel this shit. Like nobody wants to, right? And so 
unless you felt it yourself and you know what it takes to get there and what it feels like to release it, you're going to be working with your clients at the same level of fear that you have. So you aren't going to be able to discern, is this crying person at the root or is this crying person what you think is like, oh, we got there and it really isn't. Yeah, so, like you're, you're both in defense. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, because um, I, I wondered, you know, when, when cause you, you're referring to kind of set these separations, right? And the meanings and the stuff that, and really feeling into that. And I wondered if there's ever the case that by going to the earliest source of that could ever be enough to sort of um, reconsolidate, you know, a lifelong uh, well not a lifelong but you know multiple separations it or is can. it really is it really necessary to go like that one no no you it you don't have to do every one Jeez, would be in nursing homes if we had to do every that's one, what i was thinking every single yeah. one right so that's these are great questions so excuse me <laughs> um here's the thing there are themes that are connected to the experience of separation and if you get to one of the keystone, the depths of a keystone keystone th theme, it will release it from other, you know, from across the the timeline or the life lifetime or whatever it is, or from at least some of it. Not not usually not all of it, but it's almost it, it to me. It's the reason it won't release everything across everything is because there's so many complexities to a theme. So we may be releasing, you know, 60% or a hundred percent of a betrayal, just say a betrayal trauma around separation. And it releases separation trauma across much of the lifetime and betrayal trauma and everything goes with that. But then, you know, you can't get it all in one at, at once. So you may, the client may go two years and they feel fantastic and they're totally centered and betrayal doesn't hit them that way anymore. And then one day there's like a, some kind of trigger, mm -hmm. something happens and you get another like flavor of it, you know, that needs to come up, but kind of to be answering your question a little more specifically, sorry, I tend to ramble, but it's like the model isn't linear. So I can't interview linear. You know, like my brain isn't linear, and which is why the model is, I guess, the way it is. But anyway, um, there are certain keystone memories that if you clear them, they will take care of a lot of the work. You know, you don't have to do every single time you were sexually assaulted if you were an incest victim. You don't need to do every single time, you know, you were neglected and abandoned if you grew up you know, in a situation where you were constantly neglected. It just, the circuitry is such, and the problem was so usually so chronic that hitting the depth of it releases a lot of it at once. Now, that doesn't mean you get one keystone memory and you're good to go. It just means you can get gigantic chunks of work done if you go deep enough and the therapist is holding energetically or at least consciously the multidimensional nature of what the theme really is. You don't even need to talk about it with a client necessarily. It's the therapist that is holding the intention that this is going to clear beyond what it looks like you're working on. If you see what I mean, I'm yeah. sure people are going to say, oh, that's not possible. Yeah, it, it is though. If the therapist mm -hmm. is, is clear and, and, you know, is able to have that kind of access. Mm -hmm. So no, you don't have to do all those all those traumas. No way. So is it um in terms of like the end of treatment? Is it based on the client being like, man, I just feel good in mm -hmm. now in present day. I don't binge drink anymore. I don't whatever. Yes. Is that so? But if a client keeps saying, yeah, I'm still, then you're like, okay, there must be some other separation from your past we haven't thoroughly processed yet. It's, this is similar to to what the answer at the beginning of our our interview, which is it's up to the client. You know, if if they're not dr drinking anymore, or they're not having panic attacks, or they're not using, or they're out of a really abusive relationship that they couldn't get out of, or you know, I mean, just whatever it is that they came with, it was like the you know traditional mainstream, like oh, I need a therapist. Um, if if they feel like they're done, that's their choice. They're done. You know, I mean, I can go <laughs> lots of places with people, but it doesn't mean they have to. It doesn't mean they need to, and it doesn't mean there's anything wrong if they don't choose to. 
So it really does come down to what a client chooses. And by the time they have done even their kind of symptom work, just say they're they're no longer having panic attacks or whatever it is, whatever they brought, they know just by the virtue, oh, I'm sorry, by the virtue of the experience of CRM, that there's always more if you want to go there. Now, for some people, they have to go there. People, there are people who will not heal, they won't. They they won't. And a lot of times they're judged by other therapists as, you know, well, they're borderline, they can't, or this is this person just isn't going to heal. And some people won't. Some people are not going to heal in this lifetime. That's a fact. It's just not what they're going to be doing in this lifetime. No matter what they try, they're not going to, um, because of something deep inside that they're choosing that they're not even aware of usually. And so, yeah, I mean, it's up to the client. But there, I'll say this, though, this is interesting, too. You'll get people that come to a certain place in this work where it's like their their whole Ev their whole everything just starts to change internally, you know, their view of the world, their perspective on what what's truth and life and just everything, anything because of what it's like to do this work um, the way it's supposed to be done. And what can happen, though, is they'll stop even before they know that they'll stop knowing they're not complete because to complete it would mean the choice of being in alignment with the work that you've done and being in alignment in the way you live your life. And that can bring up a lot of really hard choices, you know, because we live out of alignment because we're just trying to like manage all the defense responses and like, just hope none of this is real. We're just gonna, you know, and so we pick jobs, you know, careers, spouses, um, you know, relationship with family of origins, uh, just certain certain fun things that maybe aren't that good for us or or connected to something that is not beneficial people don't want to give that up you know especially if it's a, a marital issue and they have children and you know they know if i complete my work for me to walk my talk i'm not my my, my spouse is either going to have to get with the program and do what i'm doing or vibrationally it's we're going to be incompatible so people will stop. I'm just giving you as an example. This can happen with parents. It can happen with best friends. It can happen with your bosses at work. It can happen with what you're, the organization you're choosing to work for, even what you're doing for a living, you know, can all be like the cataracts are removed. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, because this stuff gets to like, it, like you see. And so if you don't, if you're not up for, <laughs> if you're not up for, you know, doing the, going further in terms of your actual life choices on really, really hard decisions and choices and things that could potentially just really rock your world or somebody else's world, people have, and I don't judge this at all because I get it. People have the choice to just stop where they are. It's like, get take take what they got and that's it. And there's that little piece of them that's just going to make that choice very consciously and with informed choice and hopefully with complete total self-love and acceptance and compassion for why they are not going to completely get to that place of, I don't know what word to use, just 100% res resolution of, mm -hmm. of self, you know? Yeah, I can imagine just sort of, getting going down this getting into this work and then realizing a, a bit of the way in like oh shit i've been living my life wrong or, or yeah. how, not in alignment for so many years i think i'll just stop here exactly this is, this is good for me absolutely that absolutely happens and it happens even in my trainings because i teach like this like straight and clear and it's like i don't have you know life is short i'm not gonna try to bullshit around the issue you know and and so People don't like that. They don't. They don't want to hear it, and um, it's hard to hear. It's hard to even countenance that you have been out of alignment. That one has been out of. Again, I've done all this work myself. I'm not judging anybody. I can assure you, but it is an ob observation, not a judgment, in terms of what's going on. And yes, people, even in my trainings, will get halfway through the training and they're super triggered because what I'm teaching is they're they're going. <gasps> Never mind. I'll stick with XYZ modality. And they never, they, you know, they just won't come back or take take the advanced trainings or come to the, the study groups because it's another paradox. The truth is it's, or, or the, I won't say the truth because I can't judge what people think is true, but let's put it this way. The activation around possibility is too difficult. And, you know, people are just like, 
like what you said. Like, I'm good. I don't need to yeah. do all that. I'm not doing all that. So that's fine. But well, that's yeah, why because I, I perhaps if I, I know if I do do that, I'm going to have to really look at my life and change some stuff. Um, yeah. I wondered as on, on the sort of you mentioning the training and stuff, what does training look like in CRM? I mean, is it experiential in, in nature and are, are, are the trainees doing the work themselves too? And yes. how does that all go? Yeah. So um, the like say in all of my trainings, they are a mixture of lecture. And I hope I try not to like lecture, but it's a lecture. So didactic, let's say it's didactic. So uh, Every training is five days for the most part. Some are a little, one or two or less. A couple, you know, I'll do two or three specialty ones that are just two or three days. And I'm starting to do ones that are only a day long because people can't take off work and things like that. But the point is, is that the trainings are didactic. I do a lot of demonstrations and I pick people out of the class and I work with them so that they can see what it is that we're teaching in the moment. Then they practice. So they actually go into breakout rooms, or if I was teaching in person like I used to, you know, would be in a venue where they would break out and practice with dyads. And there's myself and other facilitators that supervise the dyads. We debrief, we have Q&A, you know, things like that. So it's it's a mixture. That's great. So really, it's you can't just uh, uh, just read about this to know how to do it. It's really being, it's doing it, doing it experientially with trainers and trainees and stuff is really the way that you guys do it. Yeah, we do. And, and, you know, we, we offer, there's two things. We offer a lot of follow-up because I myself and the other people in the organization are very aware of the massive paradigm shift that this is, you know, this is very different for, for people and difficult, not just conceptually paradigm shift, but practically, you know, how to work, how to sit with someone, how to get them to step into experientially, the most horrific, egregious assaults on the heart and the body that there have been. I mean, we're basically, it's like our clients are firemen and we're giving them all of the equipment, you know, the oxygen and the ax and the, 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 the helmet and all the stuff to go into the fire, you know, and it's, it's, we know what that's we know what it's like to learn this and to actually stick with it so we offer a lot of study groups we have a lot of webinars we do consult group consultations as well as individual consultations we have a facebook discussion group there's peer support groups you know we have a lot of post training support for anybody that does choose to really say i'm going to do this like we got you covered it's the issue is it's so big to, to practice this way and to take up the challenge. You know, I'm not even talking about practically how to get to, you know, resource somebody enough to get to the root. I'm talking about the big picture of what this means in terms of the therapist and what it will do to change your life as a therapist to be able to practice this as well as the clients, what we were just talking about, alignment issues. Um, the best way to learn it is by doing your own work with a clinician that knows what they're doing because this is something where it gets in your blood and your bones from doing it yourself. You know, it changes your own consciousness to, as a therapist, to do it and to get to, to do it, to heal through it. And that makes it much easier to work with the clients. It doesn't become such like a, oh, it's so confusing. There's so many things and there these protocols. You don't even have to think like that anymore because like somehow it's in you now. So yeah, people do follow the, pro and I do have protocols. I'm not saying there's none. I'm just saying they're a framework for the work you've already said doing your being a, a client of crm is a real good way into it but what else for, in terms of people wanting to learn more maybe get a, some book, briefer training the book yeah the book is good i mean actually this is this i'm glad you asked me because the book is really good and and it isn't just about crm it's about our paradigm the conceptualization you know it, it it really is an excellent book and i'm not plugging my book i get all of like 17 cents for a book so this isn't about that it's just about the book is a good place to start. Another thing is I've decided to deconstruct the resources in CRM um, so that it's more digestible in smaller chunks. You know, we, we've been talking about how vast and like kind of overwhelming it is to even probably listen to me talk. And the model 
itself, I, I want to make sure that it is more accessible to more people. Um, so what I've done, and I, it's on, they're on my website, I'm starting to break them down into two or three hour webinars. Um, so like one day is all, you know, the breath work. Another two or three hour, and this is for anybody. This is for anybody can take it. You don't have to be a CRM therapist. It has nothing to do with that. It's just taking what's powerful in CRM, and instead of always teaching it as a system of healing, just starting to break it down into chunks. So we have like the breath work one, attunement one, um, choice points, working with choice points in our in our lives, and that the choice points is really interesting too. There's the attachment the attachment webinar. Um, I'm going to be doing sacred geometry and toning and just basically deconstructing the model so that people who can't or just aren't ready or just choose not to use this like gigantic thing that it, it is can just at least learn pieces that they can incorporate into what they already do as best they can. Um, so those are there. Those I just, I haven't even taught those yet. They're, they're on the website though. I'm going to start teaching them in the spring. I also have, um, there's a basic training coming at the end of January. There's a basic training at the beginning of April. Um, the advanced trainings are all dur during the year. That's if you start to take the trainings. Otherwise, I would say the book, find a CRM therapist to do your own work. Um, the, these little webinars, these chunks of stuff that I'm doing, that'd be helpful. And, you know, there's also on my website, the homepage is a example of a session that I did with a client who has um, severe dissociation. And I never worked with her before. It was the, only, the first and only time I worked with her. It's a really long session. It's broke up into three chunks. And she talks about it at the beginning and the end with the experience of doing CRM for the first time. That can be really helpful as well. And then there's the Newsweek article. In April of 2017, we were the cover of Newsweek. And um, that that's a kind of cool article, although, well, you know, that 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 was a that was a good article as well. It's not quite accurate in in a lot of ways, but that's because of the editors wanted it to be a certain way. But it, it's still there to read. There's there's other research articles, so there there are things out there. Yeah, it all sounds really great. I wish we had more time to to flesh it out even more because of its kind of vastness. But I really appreciate everything you've shared about the the, the model um, and pointing people in the right direction to learn more um and yeah just grateful for your for your time today thanks and in terms of the experiential theme of your podcast i can say with crm you will experience things that you didn't even realize were possible like i need to honor the model by saying that like it's just not an experiential modality it's like an experience if you know what i mean <laughs> you, you could i just had an image of that being on your website it's an, yeah it's an experience <laughs> it is though it yeah. is no i love it yeah yeah well thank you so much lisa thank um, you for having me